guys, this is Ms. Howington here at Research Triangle High School, and today we're talking about the pelagic zone. We're talking about the zonation in the pelagic, um, as well as some challenges and adaptations that species that live here face. <clears throat> so the pelagic um, is divided into zones vertically, um, and it's by the amount of light that can penetrate to a certain depth of water and also by depth. So you can see an overview of that here. So um, we're going to consider the pelagic zone, the top three of these zones, um, and then we're going to consider the, the fourth bottom zone here, um, the deep sea. So the very, very top layer is the epipelagic zone, or the photic zone. So this is where um, light can reach. It's the top 200 meters of the sea. Um, this is where photosynthesis occurs. This is also where the highest concentrations of organisms occurs, um, which makes sense since it's where the most food is. The mesopelagic is the next layer down. It's also called the twilight zone. It's from about 200 meters to 1,000 meters. There's very little light, um, which is okay if you're a predator and you're hunting things and maybe you have like big eyes and you can see really well but it's not great um but there is no photosynthesis here at all um and some animals will migrate between the two of these zones between the epipelagic and the mesopelagic between day and night <clears throat> they'll come here at uh during the day and then we have the bath pelagic um or the dark zone there is absolutely no light here um, in the in the mesopelagic, there was a teeny tiny little bit of light, but really not a whole lot. Um, so this overlaps with the deep sea. It depends on who you talk to about the classifications of these. Um, and any light that there is here is coming from bioluminescence from organisms. Um, so since there is no light and there uh, there is no photosynthesis, so any food here is coming from higher up layers um, or detritus drifting down um, or which what we call marine snow which we'll talk about more when we talk about the deep sea so here are some challenges and adaptations that the uh, pelagic zone presents to organisms the first one that we're going to talk about is light um, so as we saw light very quickly disappears um, so the different wavelengths of light are absorbed at different depths. Um, so the red wavelength of light is the first to go away. Um, <clears throat> so uh, this is where a adaptation that I did not put on this slide comes in. Um, a lot of organisms that live in the um, mesopelagic and in the lower parts of the epipelagic zone uh, are red in color because that wavelength of light doesn't penetrate, so organisms can't see that color um, very deep down in the water. Um, this is also why organisms, uh, so chlorophyll are absorbing um, red light wavelengths, so wavelengths in this area, and they're reflecting green. Um, and so um, organisms that are doing photosynthesis have to take advantage, they have different um, parts in them that take advantage of different wavelengths of light. And then as you can see here in these um, lanternfish, so it's thought that, uh, so to having big eyes, it gives um, organisms big areas to kind of concentrate that light and gives them a better chance of seeing in the dark. Um, and it's thought that maybe eye size kind of um, changes with depth, um, but I couldn't find too much information on that. So another challenge that there is, because there is no bottom in the pelagic zone um, there is nothing for like plants to grow on or coral to grow on or like rocks to hide behind or anything like that so there's no shelter so there's really hard for organisms to hide from predators so um, one way that uh, organisms have kind of um, gotten around that and adapted to that situation is the deal vertical migration or the diurnal vertical migration um, so organisms will come up to the epipelagic at night because that's where all of the, um, especially a lot of like smaller organisms that are going to feed on phytoplankton. So all the phytoplankton are hanging out in the epipelagic because that's where they can photosynthesize. Um, and so small organisms will come up and feed at night and then during the day they'll go 
back down deeper into the mesopelagic um, so that they can use the dark as kind of their uh, hiding mechanism. And then um, a lot of organisms use counter shading. So if you look down in the ocean, you're looking down to where there is no light coming. So organisms will be really dark on top. So they'll kind of blend into that dark water. Whereas if you look up from, if you like go swimming and you look up, you see the sunlight coming down through the top of the water. Um, and so organisms will be really light colored on the bottom to kind of blend in with that light that is coming from higher up above. Um, another challenge that organisms face is that the uh, pelagic zone in general is just very sparsely populated. So that makes it really hard to find mates. Um, so some organisms have uh, made themselves easier to find by using bioluminescence or chem chemical signals um, to kind of like tell mates like, hey, I'm over here. Um, and uh, also organisms tend to congregate during unique events. So like if there's a full moon or, um, or something like that, that they can sense the change in the gravity, um, then they'll congregate in one specific area that they've always congregated in um, and use that area to mate. The other issue with uh, the pelagic being sparsely populated makes it really hard to find food. So a lot of organisms are not picky eaters. They'll eat whatever they can find, um, so to kind of get around that. Um, a lot of organisms have heightened senses, so uh, a lot of sharks have the ampullae of Lorenzi um, along their heads, and this helps them sense uh, changes in pressure and electrical signals. So to help them find prey that might be moving in the water, um, a lot of animals can like maybe smell different chemicals or detect different chemicals like blood in the water um, or like the big eyes that we talked about to help find, um, to help concentrate the light and to see food. And again, that deal vertical migration, um, migrating to the food at night and then back to the cover of uh, the mesopelagic in the daytime. Um, so using bioluminescence to attract your prey. So a lot of anglerfish are known for this. So they use this little bioluminescent thing here kind of as a lure um, and fish swim towards it, maybe thinking it's a mate, maybe just curious. Um, and then the anglerfish can eat them. Um, and then, so if you're, it's a long time between meals, then um, you gotta really conserve your energy because you're not getting energy all of the time. So organisms will usually either have a really hydrodynamic body, like um, if you look at like tuna or sharks or things that swim really quickly, they have a hydrodynamic body, so they're pretty efficient at moving through the water. Um, that or they'll move slowly. So things that are like bigger like the anglerfish or the mola mola um, That don't look sleek and like they're fast swimmers. They're not um, They just move really slow to conserve energy Another issue that organisms start to face um, as you go down in the water column after you leave the photic zone is a really sharp drop-off in oxygen content um, <clears throat> And so, as we know, this is a very necessary reactant in respiration reactions in the body um, to, to give organisms energy that they need. Um, and so one way that organisms uh, deal with this is that they just conserve energy. So like we talked about earlier, so they'll go slow or they really have a hydrodynamic form. Um, this is a picture of a study that people did of uh, the shapes of fish throughout time from fossils um, and like these uh, really skinny fish that have skinny noses are really good at rapid acceleration, um, whereas these fish, um, they have a lot of surface area, so they tend to be pretty flat. Um, they're good at maneuvering, but they're not good at swimming really fast. High pressures. Um, so a lot of organisms, as they dive down to try and find food in that um, sparsely populated area, they are subject to very quickly increasing um, pressures. So a lot of organisms that do a lot of diving to find food and hunt food um, will, like a lot of sharks and cartilaginous, other cartilaginous fish, they do not have um, uh, swim bladders like a lot of other bony fish do. Um, so the air and swim bladders of bony fish can be compressed uh, as pressure increased. And so it gives them a it makes it harder for them to control their buoyancy. Um, but sharks have an oily liver, 
um, another cartilaginous fish, and the oil can't be compressed, but it's very buoyant. It helps them float in water. Um, Culliver's beaked whale is the deepest diving mammal, um, so they have to be able to come up to the surface and breathe air, but then they also dive down to over 2,000 meters, um, which is uh, kind of ridiculous and crazy. So they can um, fold in their ribs and collapse their lungs so that they reduce air pockets so that when they um, come back up, they don't have as much air to expand and it'll still fit in their lungs. Um, so, but another problem that comes from this is that they don't have as much oxygen in their lungs. And so to deal with this, they are able to slow down their heart rate um, to, to deal with this. All right, guys, so that is all I have for you about the pelagic zone, about the challenges and the adaptations that organisms have come up with to face those challenges. So I will see you guys in class.